Good morning and welcome to this, the ninth meeting of 2013 of the European and External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request to turn off um, mobile phones and electronic gadgets as they interfere with our broadcasting. And agenda item one is the decision to take uh, um, agenda item four in private and to remind the committee that we previously agreed to take items five and six in private too. Members in agreement? Good. Thank you very much. Moving on to the second item on our agenda, which is a continuation of a Scottish Government country plan for China International Framework Inquiry. And uh, we have, over the past few months, um, been conducting the inquiry into the Scottish Government's country plan for China. Um, the inquiry is focused upon the strategy for economic engagement between Scotland and China uh, set out in the China Plan and the perceived benefits to be drawn from this policy. The inquiry will also consider the potential for further strengthening of the plan and subsequent trade relations with China. Um, and today, our evidence session and this inquiry today, we will now hear some oral evidence from the um, the Minister. So can I welcome the Minister Hamza Yusuf, Minister for External Affairs and International Development, and can I welcome both his government officials, I think Heather Jones and Ed Payne. Welcome. Welcome back to committee. Ed, you've been here before. Um, I think, Minister, you have a brief opening statement. Yes, thank you, Convina, and good morning uh, to you and to the committee. Thank you uh, for inviting me to speak to you about the Scottish Government's engagement with China as part of the committee's inquiry into international framework uh, and country plans. Our country plans, uh, including the recently published China strategy, sits beneath the international framework. The framework explains the what uh, and the why and the where of our international engagement. It renews the government's commitment to developing a focused approach to our overseas engagement so we can deliver maximum benefit for Scotland on the world stage in pursuit of that overarching goal of promoting sustainable economic growth in Scotland. China is now, uh, as you'll be aware, the second largest economy in the world and is growing fast. It is critical that Scotland continues to build on its presence and focus on opportunities for Scotland and Scottish businesses in China. Now, the Scottish Government's China strategy, published in December 2012, sets out clear priority areas, uh, associated targets, and how we will deliver those targets. Now, the China strategy is an important statement of commitment from the Scottish Government. China is a highly competitive market. Scotland already has world-class companies, world-class talent, research excellence, and world cast industries. We need to ensure we fully exploit these assets in China for the economic gain of Scotland. <clears throat> China, in its 12th five-year plan, has prioritised seven industry sectors. In four of those sectors, Scotland has world-class world strengths, uh, namely in energy, energy conservation, uh, biotech, biotechnology, and new IT. Uh, this is why life sciences, energy, and creative industries are all highlighted in our China strategy as priority areas. We also have a focus on delivering luxury provenance products to the expanding consumer class, especially Scotland's excellent food offerings uh, and, of course, whisky. Uh, the other area of priority is financial services, particularly asset management, which, we have, which you have heard the importance of uh, from Angus Tullock at your roundtable discussion. We are seeing uh, ambition from our Scottish companies to enter China. China has been ranked first by Scottish businesses as a future market and has been identifi identified by most growth sectors uh, as being in the top five future geographies for them wanting to break into. We need to support our businesses and sectors to turn this demand into export. However, doing business in China can be often challenging. That is why we need to take a very targeted approach, also focusing on where Scotland is most competitive. We also need to take uh, a long-term view. It takes time and effort to establish a presence. Government-to-government -government relations have a critical role uh, to play in giving business culture in, uh, in China, and therefore uh, ministers have a, a role in opening doors and fostering high-level relationships. SDI staff are on the ground in China. Uh, they have increased their staff in mainland China by 30% in the last year, as well as opening a new office in Shenzhen. SDI has more than doubled the companies they've assisted uh, in the last three years, and this continues to rise. So, Convener, we're moving in the right direction, but need to maintain pace and focus. However, as James Anderson expressed to the committee in its last meeting, uh, the opportunity in China is similar to the opportunity in the USA 100 years ago. Not only does Scotland have to be there, it needs to be competing uh, and winning against the rest of the world. Uh, this government is committed 
to supporting ambitious companies and industry. And in the China strategy, we've clearly set out how we will uh, set out this ambition and how we will pursue that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Minister. Um, I think we're going to go straight to questions from committee, and I think we're kicking off with Jamie McGregor this morning. Thank you. Good morning, Minister. Um, uh, according to the Scottish Government, um, your strategy is intended for all Scotland and has been developed after extensive engagement with key stakeholders. Um, the question, my first question is, what engagement and consultation took place with the stakeholders in developing the plan, and who were the stakeholders? Thank you, uh, and good morning uh, as well to Mr McGregor. There, there was quite a high level uh, amount of engagement, and that actually came from the 2008 report uh, into country plans that there needed to be wider engagement uh, with stakeholders. So the Scottish Government held a high-level conference in March 2012, uh, almost 100 key China partners from across sectors fed into the strategy development. I won't go through those 100 partners, but if the committee would find it useful, uh, of course we can get some of that information to them. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and External Affairs, along with the Consul General, uh, delivered a keynote speech of that. Uh, on top of that, uh, SDI arranged China uh, and investment straight specific uh, days uh, as well. We also pulled in together some very high-level stakeholders, <coughs> Angus Grossart, Sir Angus Grossart, Lord Wilson of Teleron, the former uh, Governor of Hong Kong, Sir Tim O'Shea as well from uh, Director, uh, <coughs> Director of the Edinburgh Festival, Jonathan Mills, uh, and a various amount of uh, high-level stakeholders. On top of that, uh, we found it very key and very important this time to engage with the diaspora uh, because their knowledge of the market uh, their language skills in the market, their understanding of the cultural awareness uh, was also uh, very important as well. So the engagement was, was quite extensive. Uh, and as I say, we can get a full list of who we engage with to the committee if they would find that most useful. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, how does the strategy assist organisations that wish to work with China to achieve the aims of the plan? Uh, thank you. Uh, again, it can be quite varied, uh, essentially, uh, the question is, what, does the, what can the Scottish Government do and what can SDI do in order to assist those companies? And first of all, the very first thing uh, we have responsibility to do is to make sure we, uh, that a company is truly ready to enter into that market. Uh, the Chinese market is different than uh, many other markets that co Scottish companies will work with, uh, be the European markets or the markets in North America, those traditional markets that Scottish companies are usually quite comfortable with. Uh, the range of things that the uh, SDI and the Scottish Government and other partners can, can help to do varies right from the very early stages in terms of finding out their export potential, uh, but also in terms of holding market awareness events to see the interest, uh, market analysis in terms of where they want to focus their energies, where, uh, what geographical areas they might want to focus on. Once they get into country, there can be a number of uh, ways that we can help. Uh, they can be, uh, SDI have given grants in previous cases. Uh, they've helped even in, in regards to, uh, if we take the uh, example of Stag Bakeries in Stornoway, even helped with how to package their sea biscuits uh, so that they, they look more luxury and, uh, and appealing to that consumer class. So uh, the, the, the amount of support that's available really is, a, is an incredible range, right from the very inception stage when somebody has the idea of wanting to export to China, all the way through to the, the, their in country uh, as well. When you say um, is it that you want to make sure that a company is ready to export to China, it was suggested in evidence, I believe, that um, companies should sort of cut their teeth, maybe exporting to Europe first, before are going on to China, but supposing a company had an idea that was specific to China, why should it have to 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 go through the European model first before um, going straight into the China market? I think the the member, I think you make a very good point. Uh, I don't think they would have to. Uh, they absolutely would not have to, and I should say that very clearly that no company would have to first go through Europe in order to, to, to break into China. I think the point that was uh, being made and hopefully clarified in the supplementary evidence that you received from SDI uh, was that the Chinese market is incredibly different to those traditional markets that frankly are a lot closer to home. Uh, more companies will usually have probably dealt with the Chinese market. I think there's very few companies that would go straight and, and directly into the Chinese market. It's different because government to government relations are important. It's different because the culture of doing business is incredibly different. In Europe, uh, there's often, uh, you know, it's straight down to business, it's shaking hands, it's signing a contract. Uh, in China, there's a lot more uh, relationship building, just as there is in, in, in the Gulf and some other parts 
uh, of the world. It's a lot more about building those relations, understanding the culture, and understanding sometimes uh, the, the hierarchy and the structure that's involved. And so there's, there's, there's certainly no limit, uh, there's no limitation put on companies if they want to go straight into the Chinese market, and they're ready to do that, uh, they, they will absolutely uh, get the support of SDI uh, and other uh, government agencies. Uh, but it may be uh, that, uh, that, that if a company has worked and, and exported to Europe, uh, they may already have that. That experience will hold them in good stead, but it certainly doesn't stop them. And uh, I hope the the supplementary evidence that you received uh, clarified that point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Can I just um, expand on that a wee bit um, from the stakeholders and, and to ask you where the China plan fits in um, in the bigger picture um, with other organisations, whether that's EU or worldwide? Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean. Um, the point of this, and again this was taken from the 2008 uh, report, uh, one of the main uh, recommendations coming out was that you have to collaborate better with, with other agencies. Uh, and I have to say we work very closely, even if you take uh, our relations with the UK government, UKTI, uh, and other bodies. And uh, it's not often Scottish government departments can say they work very, very closely with UK government departments. But I'm happy to say that we, we, we absolutely do. Um, and uh, that relationship is, uh, is strong. In terms of, of, of working with the EU and international partners, uh, you, I, I might need to ask you to slightly clarify in what respect you might mean, convener. Um, I think we had evidence, I think, from uh, Owen Kelly, who suggested, you know, that the China plan was only one small part of a oh, bigger international framework. Oh, I see, yes, um, yes, And yes, how sure, it all sure. slots together to actually create that sort of a... Um, sure, sure. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know... Although our exports to China are still uh, relatively uh, modest, and that's why the uh, targets are ambitious, we're still punching above our weight in terms of other European uh, partners. But as a part of the bigger pie, it's, it's the idea that we can't just put all our export eggs into one basket, or whiskey bottles, I suppose, in this respect, into, into, into one basket. Uh, it plays a pivotal part, an important part, and actually it's a fast, it's, it's really going to be an expanding uh, part of that international strategy, that international framework. But that's not... Uh, that's not at the expense of the work that we do in our traditional markets in Europe. Uh, it's not at the expense of the work we do in Germany and Netherlands and, of course, uh, in North America, uh, which continues to be uh, our biggest. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not at the expense of these two um, uh, markets by any stretch of the imagination, but it's actually in, in, in complement to that. Um, so we'll continue with that work and we look to increase the share of our exports as, as a total share of the total exports, increase uh, the China element. Uh, but, uh, you know, it fits in with the government's uh, economic strategy and uh, how it intends to uh, increase exports up to 2017 in order to help sustainable economic uh, growth in, in Scotland. Okay, thank you very much. And you mentioned governmental relations, and that takes us on to Claire Adamson's questions. Hey, thank you, Convener. Um, Minister, you've already touched on how important the personal relationships are at all levels um, in, in engaging with China, and I'm specifically interested in in what plans the Scottish Government have to use ministerial visits to further the aim of the China plan and um, if you could give us an idea of how SDI's involvement in that um, actually enhances the China plan. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, again, it was uh, referring to my opening statement that government to government relations are uh, incredibly important. Uh, and. Uh, you know, going even a step further than that hierarchy, even within uh, government to government level, uh, can be incredibly important. There's frankly uh, more doors that first ministers can open than uh, any, than any other member uh, of the Scottish government, and that goes not just uh, uh, with China, but I think other uh, markets too. And government to government relations are incredibly important. And one example of that uh, may well be the recent job announcements. Uh, well, uh, now last year, job announcements in 2012 by uh, the company Three in Glasgow, call centre jobs, over 300 uh, call centre jobs. And that came as a result of the government-to-government -government contact the First Minister had with uh, Canning Falk, the, the chief exec of the parent company of, of, of Three, and those discussions continued and continued since his visit. Uh, and SDI, to answer the second part of your question, uh, greatly assist in that. I mean, SDI are pulled in right at the beginning, at the inception stage of uh, when we decide we're going to be travelling out to, to, to China to, to see what discussions have been continuing. Uh, in the case of SDI, they have three offices in mainland China, one in, uh, in, in Hong Kong. The, uh, and 
they have uh, members of staff on the ground that they've increased again by, by 30 per cent. Uh, and so they will use those networks that they have on the ground uh, in order to inform and to feed into us uh, you know, uh, what potential opportunities exist for ministers, where they can be best used. It's not every day, of course, ministers can travel over. Uh, so when they do, we make sure that that uh, engagement is, is, is critical and focused. When we took um, the evidence from the financial services um, and, and the asset management um, area in particular, they said that they quite often use alternate routes into China. They use the established um, uh, financial centres in Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, and in Taiwan to actually um, access into China. Um, are there any plans to, to maybe look at, at expanding the ministerial involvement in those areas to try and, and enhance that route into China? It's certainly something that I'm always happy to explore uh, and to look at. And you know, we're looking closely at the evidence that was given by people like uh, Angus Tullock, whose uh, experiences speaks uh, absolutely for itself. And when the, fun, when the first minister was over uh, in Beijing in, in, in December 2011, he made financial services one of the key areas uh, to target. Uh, he delivered uh, a welcome speech at the Asset Management Forum uh, in Beijing, around 50 high-level contacts, but continued SDI engagement within China. But I think that's an incredibly interesting way to explore that. Uh, if you want to get into a market, uh, we have to understand there's various hubs. Uh, to go through in Singapore, uh, more than any other country, has shown how, how, how it can be one of those hubs. And we have an SDI presence in Singapore, and we have for, for a number of years, so that's certainly something that uh, I'd be open to, to exploring. Sir? Thank you very much. Talking about exploring, I think Willie Coff is going to pick up on Airlinks. <laughs> Thanks very much. Good morning, Minister. Um, we, were, we were talking, some of the witnesses were talking to the committee over previous weeks about um, air routes and direct routes between Scotland and, and China, and, and they specifically mentioned that this could, could be a potential huge boost for us in developing our market with, with, with China. Um, I would imagine the Scottish Government would support this, and could you give the committee some kind of indication of what might be happening to see if we can establish direct direct routes with China to serve Glasgow or Edinburgh or even in, in fact Prestwick in my part of the part of Scotland. For that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was waiting for the, the mention of Prestwick uh, from, the, from the member but uh, no, he, his point is absolutely correct uh, in that be it for the tourism targets we have, for the export and trade targets, the education targets, the cultural targets, all of them, absolutely every single one of them would be enhanced with that direct uh, air link of that, there's simply uh, no doubt whatsoever. So <clears throat> the Scottish Government has been has been focused on, on trying to get that. Yeah, there will be an understanding amongst committee members that it is an in incredibly competitive global market, um, where in some areas and aspects Scotland's geography certainly helps us, some other aspects our geography doesn't. Uh, but we are starting to build our reputation as a hub to connect on to, 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 to Europe. Uh, and uh, the other way uh, on to the, the USA. Um, so we've had those discussions, and uh, the First Minister and, and himself, when he was out in China, um, had those discussions with uh, the, the, the Civil Aviation Administration uh, of China. Uh, at the time, uh, they'd put us on to a specific carrier to have those conversations uh, about uh, a direct air route to Scotland. Uh, it's fair to say, after a couple of years, not progressed uh, as much as we would have uh, liked in that respect. And so, having had discussions, the Chief Executive of Transport Scotland in April was out having uh, discussions with CAAC uh, again, uh, and their suggestion was that you go to the carriers directly, uh, that you go to China Air uh, directly in the states, uh, state-owned uh, carriers direct to start to have those conversations. So that's something we're certainly going to pick up, and uh, uh, if there's any updating on those conversations, and again, I'm sure they will be absolutely included in any further discussions that we have at a ministerial level, or indeed. SDI on the ground, but as updates come in, I'm more than happy to, to keep you informed. Though I, I wouldn't necessarily hold out hope from, from Prestwick, but I, that's not to say that it won't happen uh, by any stretch. Do, do, do you see, do the Chinese themselves see these as opportunities too? Because sometimes we focus on our, our needs and our ambitions in developing relationships with any particular country, but what about the, the Chinese view? Do they have a view in this and do you think they would be supportive of a direct route straight to Scotland, or are they happy with present arrangements? 
market demand. If there's a market, if there's an opportunity there, uh, they think they can make uh, you know it'd be beneficial for for both China and for Scotland in terms of. Uh, the economic and financial uh, benefits, then absolutely, and we have to make that case. And I think there is a case. In fact, there is a case. Definitely, is a case uh, in that regard. Uh, but also, as I was saying in my previous answer, uh, Scotland being a hub to go on to further destinations uh, might also appeal. And that's another part of the case that we're trying to make uh, with, the, with the Chinese uh, aviation uh, authority. So there's a number of things, but I, certainly there would be a benefit, and there is an increasing uh, consumer class that is interested in coming to not just the UK, but to Scotland uh, for our festivals uh, and, frankly, for our golf and for our whisky uh, as well, which is incredibly popular. So, certainly, I think it's of increasing interest and it's for us to make the case of where it makes, uh, where the financial sense uh, in that comes in. Okay. Um, on, the, on the question of trade barriers and tariffs, that has been raised a few times by some of the witnesses and also by some of the companies that the members visited during the course of the inquiry. Um, we're aware that uh, import tariffs from Scotland into China are, are, are quite a debilitating effect on some companies' ability to do business there. And we also understand there's a tax rebate system from China, Chinese exports to the rest of the world, and particularly to Scotland. So there was a wee bit of concern about that. Minister, what, what can we do in terms of the Scottish Government and our relationship with the UK to try to work on this issue to make it more of a, a level playing field, perhaps, for, for Scottish companies to be able to compete? Yeah, and the, the member hits on the, the correct phrase. It's about working with the UK uh, Government to do that. And I think um, in, terms of how, in terms of trade barriers uh, that we face and tariffs that we face going into China, uh, as the UK compared to certainly other countries across the world, it's still actually uh, at a reasonable, uh, I would say. But there are those barriers, uh, the trade and, and tariff barriers. Uh, and there are also, as you mentioned, the tax rebate for, for, for Chinese companies. So SDI are, are liaising with uh, BIS, uh, Department of Trade and, and Policy Unit, in the UK government uh, to fully understand those concerns and consider any further action uh, that we can be take. So we're currently awaiting a response in terms of those discussions with, with BIS. Yes, and once uh, that discussion has taken place and they've formulated a response, I'll certainly feed back uh, to this committee. But we are we are aware, and uh, it goes back to uh, what I was saying in my, my opening statement. It's an incredibly competitive, and we have to show that we're able to compete. But that's where the government-to-government -government relations can also come in uh, handy, uh, UK government relations uh, as well, and working closely with the UK uh, government too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Can I pick you up on um, a question that Claire Adamson explored with you and maybe explore it a wee bit more? And it's about the financial management and asset um, uh, management, financial services and asset management market. And you talked a bit about how the First Minister had made that one of his priorities in the last visit. Um, could you maybe give us a wee insight into whether we should be putting more emphasis on that market and whether there's plans to include that in the next refresh? I, mean, I think it certainly uh, is an important uh, part. Scotland is still, and Edinburgh in particular, but Scotland as a, as a nation is still seen as a real, uh, is, is still viewed as a, having a very strong reputation when it comes to financial management, financial uh, asset uh, management. Um, where we can assist uh, best, and Angus Tullock uh, I think made this point uh, very well at the roundtable discussion, where we can help best in terms of a government, I believe, when it comes to financial management and asset management, is through that government-to-government -government relations. I mean, they don't necessarily need financial aid or financial help or grants, uh, market awareness. They, they, they have all of that in abundance, in fact. Uh, where we can help is helping with key contacts and key networks uh, and so on and so forth. The areas that we've chosen in terms of priority um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the current plan uh, is not at the exclusion of others. It's just to say this is where we're targeted and this is where we're focused based on what our stakeholders uh, tell us, but also where we have strengths already. It makes sense to build upon those strengths in, 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 in country too. But I'm always happy to explore uh, what further we can do in terms of uh, assisting financial, uh, financial management uh, or asset management uh, companies. Okay, um, Claire, I think, is going to pick up on branding and visibility. Yes, um, uh, Minister, um, on the 7th of May, uh, in the Herald, it was reported that Scottish Enterprises to spend up to £2.5 million on a team of international public relations experts to help promote Scotland abroad. So I was just wondering, um, with an increased public relations budget, um, how the Scottish Government and organisations such as SDI would be used to promote Scotland abroad, and how would this contribute to 
delivery of the international framework, particularly in the China plan? Yeah, thank you for the, the question. I should say um, uh, it's not for me to always take issue with newspapers and the reporting, of course, of articles, but uh, actually that contract was a saving uh, when it came to you know, retender for the next four years. Uh, not only is it a potential saving of, of, of one million, uh, but also it's, it's a resource that's available not just to Scottish Enterprise, but to visit Scotland and events Scotland and other uh, such agencies uh, as well. So it's a kind of collaborative uh, approach to that Team Scotland collaborative approach to international marketing. That's incredibly important. It is absolutely vital. I keep saying that it's a, uh, a globalised world and it's competitive. And I think in some respects, you know, we can't just rely on the fact that People know Scotland, uh, they've heard of Scotland, they have a warm feeling towards Scotland, all of that is true, but we have to be up there and pushing and promoting exactly what we mean by Scotland, what, what opportunities are available, uh, what benefits there are here in, in, in Scotland. So that'll be incredibly vitally important. Visibility uh, always helps, uh, be that through Disney films uh, that help to, 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 to uh, portray Scotland's image. Uh, across the world, or be that through major international events, like we have, of course, in 2014, Commonwealth Games, uh, Ryder Cup, Homecoming. Uh, you know, getting the message out about what benefits those events can bring, uh, and, and th th that is hugely important. So the international branding of Scotland, uh, any global brand expert will tell you that uh, it's not enough to just say that you're creative and you're innovative. Every country says they're creative and they're innovative, and that is true in Scotland's case, of course. You have to be able to tailor your message much more specific, and uh, uh, and, and I think that certainly this budget will, will will help to do that. Okay, Jamie, I think you're going to pick up some of these. Yes, yet. thank you, um, Minister. In evidence to the committee, uh, Giles Blackburn from the China Britain Business Council suggested that support was needed to increase companies' visibility in China. That Scottish companies. Um, so the question is, how can the China plan help support Scottish companies to increase their visibility in the Chinese market? There's a number of things uh, that can be done. Uh, and in the SDI supplementary evidence uh, that was given to you, there's a, a whole range uh, of... Uh, uh, a whole range of uh, things that SDI in particular uh, can do. Uh, that can be from... Ah, oh, did you only receive it this morning? Yes, uh, I don't think we're ready. It may, it may <laughs> okay, be then yeah. quite... Uh, yes, I can understand maybe perhaps why people haven't had... Uh, yeah. But if you, if, if, uh, I, I, I assure you it's a very good paper. Uh, and uh, if you get to the paper, uh, there's a number of things that can be done from page... Uh, in fact, if you, look, if you look at the whole thing, actually, uh, what, one of the things we can do... I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the things we can do is use our Global Scott network. The Global Scott network uh, that Scottish Enterprise, SDI have... Uh, high-level businessmen and women uh, market experts uh, that can use their influence, their contacts, their skills, their knowledge to help companies, a uh, free mentoring service for companies that want to, 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 to access those particular uh, markets. On top of that, they can help to, SDI can assist in terms of building capacity. The plan uh, also mentions uh, that as well uh, through Talent Scotland, as I've said, through Global Scott, through mentoring. Market research is an important part of what we can do uh, as well, market entry, but once they're actually in country, we can help them get visibility via very important exhibitions, for example. Uh, these trade fairs, trade expos um, uh, are incredibly important. So there's a whole range of things that we can, we can do. Uh, business incubation uh, is another one uh, as well. So there's a, a whole range of measures which are instrumental to the delivery, as you, uh, as you rightly say, to the delivery of the plan. And without, uh, you know, we will not make the level of penetration that we want to in the Chinese market. Okay. Um, uh, he, uh, Giles Blackburn also mentioned the importance to a company's profile of having an office in China. And we know that from the experience of Marine Harvest, who've who, who done well out of that. Um, and the, also the potential for running business incubation schemes. Um, are schemes such as business incubation being considered for their potential by the Scottish Government and its agencies, and is increasing Scotland's profile likely to increase investment from China? Uh, yes, uh, is, is, is certainly the short answer. Um, the China, the China British Business Council um, offers uh, the incu business incubation scheme through its Launchpad uh, service, uh, and SDI uh, directs businesses towards that Launchpad service. So it provides a simple, uh, cost-effective, low-risk. 
um, and legal means of having a presence in China before you actually set up an office, which is, of course, a big leap for, 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 for many uh, companies to do. So the CBBC will then employ a project manager uh, dedicated to help taking that business forward uh, in China. As I say, SDI, SDI will direct them uh, towards that service. And it's available in, in, in Beijing, uh, Shanghai, Shenzhen, uh, as well as uh, many other areas across China. So I think incubation schemes have, a, have an important part to play, uh, certainly. Uh, and just before making that uh, definite commitment of setting up a presence, which is, 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 is rightly important uh, as well in the Chinese market. Thank you, Colleen. Yep, thanks very much. I think we're moving on to Rod Campbell now. Um, morning, Minister and panel. Um, earlier this month, Scottish Enterprise produced a refreshed business plan um, with the aim of accelerating Scotland's economic recovery uh, with the name of uh, improving international sales by $1.7 billion. Um, how is Scottish Enterprise going to do this? Is the Scottish Government going to provide additional funding? or What, what can you tell me about that? I mean, while there's no plans to, to allocate uh, additional funding towards the delivery of the strategy, what you do want to do is use the best use of existing funding pools. That's not to say we're limiting our funding by any stretch, but it has to be about what market opportunity uh, exists uh, out there. So um, we take that Team Scotland approach and, and, and how we do that. We maximise collaboration uh, across Scotland, uh, focused intensely on those key areas where Scotland has its biggest strengths, prioritising uh, what we can provide to the Chinese market, ensuring appropriate actions are taken into that uh, business plan. We're increasing our export performance overall is a key priority. I mean, just take the last year, you have the uh, uh, table, the spice briefing, uh, HMRC figures on how incredibly well Scotland has competed over the last year, taking our, our exports to the highest uh, level yet, in terms of the highest share, in fact, actually, uh, as well, uh, or almost the highest share in terms of 2.9% of our exports. And that's not necessarily about increasing the funding that we give towards that, but actually making our, using the existing funding pools that we have, not limiting it, but doing it on, on what market opportunity uh, is available. Thank you. Ask a couple more questions, Kavina. Um, uh, we've concentrated primarily on one guiding principle. One of the other, uh, the three guiding principles, is obviously respect for human rights and the rule of law. And you referred earlier on, Minister, to the international framework, which has got a fairly limited commitment to the protection and expansion of human rights. What's your view on this area generally? And, uh, for example, issues such as uh, due diligence checks being carried out by business. Could, could we move on to perhaps... Uh, putting a bit more help and assistance in that area? Yes, uh, as the member says, it's an underlying principle uh, that we have in our China strategy. Uh, we're not shying away from it because we believe, just as EU strategy uh, of engaging with China says, that actually the, the respect of the rule of law and human rights uh, is in China's best interest in terms of economic development and economic prosperity. And so we expect, of course, Scottish companies to, to um, respect the, the, the rule of law in whichever country they operate in, uh, but also taking the, uh, taking the ROGI principles uh, in terms of business transparency, and uh, uh, this is a UN-recognised uh, uh, principles in terms of how businesses should operate uh, across the world. Uh, we're having discussions, the UK government's also having discussions uh, about how they can implement those uh, ROGI principles and, and, and uh, make them uh, inherent in, in, in terms of, and, and cement them and entrench them uh, a little bit uh, more in terms of the business that they do uh, overseas. So it's important for us and it always has been important for us. I think Angus Tullock um, also made the point though, and made it correctly, that you have to, you have to raise human rights when the appropriate opportunity arises. Uh, otherwise, it's incredibly counterproductive, both not just, not just I'm not talking economically counterproductive, but, uh, but counterproductive in terms of actually moving the human rights agenda forward. Um, the First Minister on previous visits has invited uh, Amnesty International, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, Professor Alan Miller, to engage and to discuss uh, what, what we, uh, how to best forward the human rights agenda and the rule of law agenda uh, in China. Uh, if ministers go out uh, in the future, that invitation will absolutely be opened up again to Amnesty International and to the Scottish Human Rights Commission again. Yeah, I think one of the, the panellists, I'm not sure it was, referred to kind of the difficulties of trying to lecture people, uh, from, from, certainly coming from the UK, in the background of the opium wars of the last century, that they, you have to tread warily when you're dealing with these issues. Would, would you agree with that? Yes, I would, and you know, um, it doesn't it doesn't help anybody uh, lecturing. Uh, be it if we go over to, 
to, to, to the Middle East, to China, to the Far East, uh, to the African uh, continent as well. Um, you know, there's a way of, of, of getting, and it's, it's similar to a friendship, I suppose, on a, on a personal level. It's, you're going to probably get more results with a friend if you take them to the side, you speak to them about their behaviour, about how you might want to, how you, you know, give them a, a sincere and genuine advice that would be to the benefit uh, of your relationship. Uh, they would take that a lot better than if you were to publicly uh, ridicule them. Uh, so there, there are ways in, of, of doing it tactfully. Uh, that's where the importance uh, of Amnesty International, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, come in, because they understand that those complexities, absolutely. They want to get the same results that, that, that we want to get. So in terms of our past history as the, the, the UK and many areas uh, of the world, of which uh, indeed Scotland uh, had a role uh, to play as well, uh, it doesn't do us... Uh, necessarily uh, always the best to, to point our finger into lecture. One final question. I think the, the previous in the previous session, the previous uh, when reviewing the China plan, the previous committee referred to kind of the relationships uh, with U the UK government and the UK government's China plan, for example. Um, the UK government seems to, I think, probably have hit choppy waters in some respects with China at the current time, or according to some press reports. What steps are the Scottish government make, making to try and kind of understand as far as possible the UK government's position in relation to China? We have regular dialogue uh, with the, the, the UK government and when it comes to international work. We obviously, when we go out to do visits, um, coordinated with British embassies and British high commissions uh, in those countries uh, as well. In terms of the relationship between government ministers of the UK government, uh, and counterparts in China. Uh, essentially, that's uh, that, that that's for them. Um, and although we do share that information, uh, you know, Scotland is set on its is very much in its own path in terms of building those relationships, uh, not being confused for the UK, which we're not. I mean, we, we're seen as uh, separate in the respect of what we what Scotland has to to, to offer. And government ministers, the people understand the the constitutional setup that we have. Uh, currently, so um, you know we, we liaise closely with the UK government, but I wouldn't say that we're we're there to necessarily broker relationships. That's, I don't think the UK government views our role in, in that respect, and I don't think they would necessarily welcome it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and Hanzala. Uh, Minister Hamzam Yusuf, uh, welcome to our committee. Uh, first of all, let me say that I'm really pleased with your presentation so far, but I'm also impressed with your knowledge about the different uh, attitude of trade between Europe and Asia. I think that's very encouraging and uh, I'm uh, very impressed with that. But I want to ask you a couple of questions and they may be a bit detailed and therefore if you don't have the full response today, I'm quite happy to get it from you in due course. And one of those uh, questions I would like to ask you is, can the Scottish Government actually demonstrate or provide evidence that would demonstrate that there's been an increase in trade with the government's intervention in supporting companies in China. Sure. Well, thank you, first of all, to Mr. Malik for those, uh, for the deputy convener for his uh, very kind uh, words. I'll try not to disappoint him in the following answer. Um, the spice briefing that you received uh, shows that um, exports from 2007 to 2012 increased by 88%, and even last year's exports uh, have increased. It's very difficult to say what was an exact result of government uh, intervention uh, in truth, uh, but we'd like to say that we had something to do with it. Uh, we most certainly did in terms of uh, building that government to government relation. And I gave uh, an example previously about the 300, uh, over 300 jobs in three, uh, the call centre jobs in, in Glasgow, uh, you know, government intervention was important to have that relation, to have that discussion uh, in regards to the, the chief exec of the parent company uh, of three. And uh, that could only have happened with government intervention. Certain doors can only be opened uh, with government intervention. And as I said previously, even depending on the level of minister that goes out there, uh, only certain, uh, certain uh, doors uh, can be opened as well. Um, SDI has uh, also supported more and more companies uh, over the last few years uh, as well. More than 1,300 companies uh, have been supported in terms of uh, China over the last year. Um, uh, SDI has increased its support in China by 44% by as well. So government to government uh, intervention, to break it down exactly how government uh, has, has helped and uh, would be difficult, I think, to demonstrate in figures, but the fact that our export figures have increased the amount of companies, Scottish companies that are working in China, it has increased. I would like to think that the government has certainly had uh, had some input into that. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm, I'm quite keen to actually try to identify 
the exact input that the government has. So it would be helpful if we could some try and collate that information. I, I totally agree with you that government interventions are very important. There, there is no doubt about it. And therefore, um, the next question I would like to ask is, what other engagements are planned in, in a bid to increase the support to companies uh, to develop and uh, increase business activity in China? Yes. Um, we continued uh, looking at uh, when there will be the next uh, ministerial visit, and uh, that will be... Uh, hopefully we can let you know as, as, as soon as that uh, is ready to, to, to be announced. Uh, I should say in terms of government lobbying, it's, it's also important uh, if we look at some of our main exports. And uh, if, I know you've had discussions with us and I think visits to the Scottish Salmon uh, Company uh, there. Uh, of course, government intervention was important to get that export health certificate. Uh, again, looking at whisky. It was important for the geographical indication of origin status that could only be pushed through uh, via government. Uh, in terms of the language barrier even, uh, and, 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 and getting more uh, young Scots in particular to, to, to learn Mandarin, uh, government intervention in regards to the relationships between in educational institutes uh, is very, very important. And so we'll continue government uh, engagement and uh, you know, we plan visits uh, to China and inward delegations, as this committee is only a more, a more than aware of, uh, are important for us and to ensure that uh, uh, we, we get the maximum benefit of those visits. And I'm happy to keep the committee updated on uh, outward going uh, visits when they're, they're ready to be uh, announced. Thank you. You've, you've mentioned a couple of times in your presentation this morning in regards to the Diabra's uh, use in terms of support our industry and, in fact, culture. We've not really touched much about culture today, but I know that the Chinese community have a very rich culture and it's very diverse and it's very active in, in well, in Glasgow, I know for a fact. I'm, I'm sure it's the same throughout Scotland. I'm just wondering, um, how much of that are we tapping into in terms of using our uh, local businesses from the Chinese community to engage with China. I know that the government interventions are very, very helpful and they do open doors, absolutely. But I'm just wondering, are we actually encouraging the people from the community to support that uh, effort as well? Because I believe that uh, there are a lot of small companies in Scotland who perhaps to date have not had that opportunity uh, and it may open doors for them as well if we were using the the local communities to support us in that activity. Yes, I think the, the, the vice convener uh, makes a, an excellent point. Uh, not only uh, is it relative to the Chinese diaspora, in fact, all the diasporas in, in Scotland or in Glasgow, I, I genuinely don't think we use them enough. Uh, their skills, their knowledge, their expertise, uh, I can certainly say that from my, my, my own diaspora community, uh, we don't use that knowledge and expertise enough. So the development of the China plan was uh, an attempt to rectify that, to understand that and to rectify that. So we had an, uh, uh, an event just for the stakeholders um, to, to help develop that plan. But going forward, uh, using networks like the Young Chinese Professional uh, Networks, using students as well. And those students that pass through Glasgow University, Edinburgh University, St Andrews, Aberdeen, uh, then go back to China, using those students who then become incredible ambassadors because vast, vast majority of those that pass through have such a great experience of Scotland. But perhaps we can do more to ensure that we keep in touch and use their skills when they go back uh, to country. The important part in terms of implementation of this plan is the uh, stakeholders, uh, the stakeholders implementation delivery uh, forum, uh, and that will ensure that uh, there's diaspora uh, representation and feedback uh, into that as well. So th there's certainly more that we can be doing. I agree entirely with the member that uh, those skills and those expertise uh, should be used. And just to uh, finish off, uh, Minister, in terms of big countries, I mean, uh, during our uh, evidence sessions, um, some people had suggested that perhaps you know we're, we're concentrating far too much on China and we should be looking at nearer home as well, uh, particularly uh, Middle East and South Asia. Uh, and I know that uh, you have a personal interest in that area anyway. And I'm just wondering whether it would be an idea to, for the Scottish Government to actually talk to the local authorities uh, where uh, they can actually support businesses. Because, I, for example, uh, Glasgow City Council has had a history of supporting small businesses and they've also supported businesses to, to travel overseas to encourage trade. And I'm just wondering, and those seem to have fallen by the wayside, and I'm just wondering whether there was any scope for the Scottish Government to get together with some of the local authorities to see how we could use our uh, local communities. And particularly since we're coming up to the Commonwealth Games, it's a very good opportunity for us 
to try and tap into many of those uh, communities to try and maximise our trade activity in the coming year. I think the point is, is well made. Uh, you know, local authorities will have a great grasp of those businesses uh, within their communities, and, and we do do it. I mean, Scottish Development International, uh, be it through uh, regional hubs, uh, but also uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and other regional partners, uh, will we'll, we'll absolutely do that. And I think the suggestion is well made. I'll happily look into uh, how we can do that further, and uh, not just uh, for China, uh, but uh, as he says, uh, for, for other countries too. And just picking up on that, that, that first point that you made, uh, I'd just like to reiterate that the China plan, although we're ambitious, although we want to increase our exports and our share of exports uh, to China, we do not see that being at the expense of the work that we do in Europe, our biggest uh, export markets in, in Europe and in, in North America. We don't see it at the expense of that, but actually we just understand that you have to, diver you have to diversify. And if you're not in these places, uh, then you know we, we miss out on a huge opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister, can I just pick up on one point? Um, <clears throat> and it's, I don't want to uh, frighten Ed here, but it's how uh, the Scottish Government monitor SDI's work and review um, the quality of that work and whether they're doing what it says in the tin. Yeah, again, it's a very good uh, point to make, and uh, I'm sure Ed's never frightened, but uh, nonetheless, SDI's board is made up of representatives of Scottish Government, of Scottish Enterprise, uh, of Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and there's a constant review of that. Uh, it has to be said, uh, SDI's performance over the last few years has been incredible. Uh, you know, in terms of Scotland becoming a region for uh, number one in terms of the UK when it comes to foreign direct investment that leads on to, to jobs. Second, when it comes to foreign direct investment and the whole, uh, just second to the south uh, region, uh, which includes London, of course. Uh, so we punch uh, way above our weight. And in terms of exports, they have been uh, increasing. Uh, steadily in terms of international exports taken as a whole, uh, increasing as well. So, so the, the performance has been uh, very positive. But uh, you have to keep that. Uh, that's not to say it's complacent by any stretch uh, of the imagination. So the, the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise sit on the board and uh, uh, monitor that, that performance. But I think it's been, it's been to the great credit and great benefit of Scotland over the, the last few years, certainly. OK, thanks Thanks for that. And one other thing is um, one of the great exports that Scotland has um, sold to the world for centuries now is our education system and, and how we can bring um, uh, learning and, and the, the, the skills that, that we have developed over having a, a free education system. And one of the challenges that some of the businesses, I think, uh, have as well is about um, how UKBA have responded to some of this and the impact that has then had on uh, quality uh, research and PhD students coming to your universities, uh, quality business people coming here to, to invest and grow their business. Um, I suppose what I, I want to know is whether you've built some of that into the plan and what then negotiations are going on with the UK government to try and resolve some of these, these challenges. Yeah, Kavita, you make, you make a, a really good point because uh, some factors, of course, are, are within our control. Other factors we work closely with the UK government with and, and frankly, other factors are, are extraordinarily difficult to have that debate on because um, uh, others aren't necessarily willing to listen. Uh, the immigration uh, restrictions uh, that have been imposed by the UK uh, government um, have been extraordinarily uh, restrictive. Uh, immigration is one of the very, very few issues that I know of that unites businesses, trade unions and educational institutes. I can't think of another um, another issue that does that. And so the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Culture and External Affairs uh, wrote, uh, this is over a year ago now, but wrote to the then uh, Immigration Minister to make the very point that you, that you say, that this could have an impact in education, it has an impact in business, it has an impact even in our social demography. Um, the plan uh, is, is, is heavily focused on uh, one of the, uh, two of the, four, the two of the four areas, uh, educational links and, of course, the research and, 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 and development. So it's, it's, it's vitally important uh, that we have that dialogue, we continue that dialogue. And I think even the UK government, in truth, realises that the rhetoric is, is, is damaging. I mean, all you have to do is think about Prime Minister Cameron's um, last visit to India. Uh, he had to go on a real charm offensive to tell the top industry leaders students, everybody, the UK is open for business, it's open for you to come, because the message was getting out very, very clearly that the UK wasn't. 
Um, and so they, I think they understand that sometimes the rhetoric around immigration can be incredibly unhelpful, but uh, we want to portray a, a Scotland that wants to, uh, wants to be open to, to, to skilled migration, to students, uh, to international students, uh, where we see benefit, uh, our universities see benefit in that. So we'll continue to have that dialogue, but it, it can be uh, harmful, uh, it can be uh, restrictive at times. Hans Ellis, come on the point, yeah? Yeah, um, thank you. I just wanted to actually re reiterate that the, the UKBA, I think as an agency, is out of control. I think they've got it all wrong, and I think they're damaging uh, our education industry in the first instance. There are many other areas, I think there are also issues and problems, but this seems to be the biggest issue. And for us in Scotland in particular, it's a very serious issue because our universities and colleges actually depend on many overseas students. We depend on different uh, cultures putting an input in our educational system. And the fact that they have been less than helpful is has been very detrimental. And in, in fact, our, I would say it's fair to say that our universities and colleges are hemorrhaging because of that. So I think we, we need to re-double uh, our efforts in trying to resolve these issues. And I think it's a very difficult issue because even I find some of the MPs can't seem to deal with this issue. They seem to be talking to a brick wall, uh, and the level of unhelpfulness, unhelpfulness is, is just far too great, and something has to give uh, if we are to compete uh, fairly internationally, not only across Europe, but across the world. I believe we're losing students to second, third world countries now. I mean, people like Malaysia and China and other countries are attracting students who historically would have come to us in the UK. Uh, and uh, coming from Glasgow, we, I've seen numbers uh, diminish as a result of this policy. So if you can assist us in any way by persuading uh, ministers to continue to work in that area to try and encourage the UK government to intervene in some way to try and support our effort in, in encouraging students would be very helpful. Uh, I mean, uh, let me uh, put on record my recognition of Mr Malik's uh, uh, principal stance for a number of years, even before he was uh, a member of the Scottish Parliament when it came to, to, to the UKBA. And uh, I think of certain cultural events like uh, the Glasgow Piping Championships where uh, Mr Malik himself was having extraordinary difficulties with the then uh, UKBA. And clearly the UK government agrees with your assessment because they've scrapped the UKBA and uh, have taken somewhat shuffled the deck chairs and, and, uh, and taken them in-house in, in at the Home Office. But I, I agree with everything is saying, although uh, students from, from, from China, we haven't seen that uh, dip uh, necessarily. Uh, it'll be interesting to see the figures over the next few years, but uh, particularly when you look at Indian students and other international students, there's been, uh, as you described, uh, uh, hemorrhaging in terms of, uh, and, and just the message that's going out that the UK is not open and therefore Scotland is not open, I think is absolutely the wrong message in this highly competitive uh, world that we live in. Um, and uh, we will we'll certainly do uh, whatever we can. But I, I remember speaking to one university principal who told me very clearly that because the UK uh, restrictions were so severe and because the message that was going out was that uh, Scotland and the UK is not open to students, uh, that he was directing Indian students to apply to their other campus that is uh, in another location outside of the UK. Uh, so you know we, we can't we can't afford in this we can't afford literally we can't afford to for that to be the case. So I take Mr. Malik's point uh, on entirely. Thank you, Minister. We have uh, the Minister for Europe uh, from the UK government coming to committee on the 27th of June, and certainly I'm sure a lot of these questions will be on our agenda to ask him too. So we can um, alert you to that uh, and let you know how successful we were at maybe convincing. Um, I think Willie Coffey wants to come in with a supplementary, yeah? Thanks very much again, Convener Ryan. Minister, um, you mentioned in your, your opening remarks the comments from Mr Anderson. Uh, Scotland, perhaps, at this moment uh, is where we were 100 years ago with America and the opportunity that, that lay there for us. Uh, and you mentioned the strengths, uh, the key targets and strengths that China seems to be focusing on themselves and how they match up with the strength that Scotland has to offer. It would be unfair to say, not to mention, of course, though, that Mr Taylor, who came to the committee from Hidden Office, he had a different view. His view was that perhaps there was a greater return and opportunity for Scotland in developing relationships with Eastern Europe and Poland in particular, I think, that he mentioned. Um, what's, the, what's the Scottish Government view, view of this and whether the return and the potential for Scotland and Scottish companies is indeed as good as we think it may be with China 
and should we be concentrating a bit more effort perhaps in our near European, Eastern European neighbours? Yes, I think some of it goes back to, to what I was saying, that uh, one is not at the expense uh, of the other. Yes, you have to be focused and you have to be targeted, but certainly not at the expense. And the reason why we have the internal, the, the, uh, the, the yearly review, internal yearly review of the plan, uh, which is the intention, uh, is to see, OK, is the strategy working? Are we getting the return that we think we're getting for the effort? And if not, to be able to be flexible uh, within that. Um, but uh, the figures show that, that uh, again, you have it in your, your, your SPICE briefing, the HMRC figures show you know, an 88 per cent increase from 2007 till 2012 in terms of exports. That's a huge uh, increase. And uh, I agree entirely with Mr Anderson that, you know, uh, I thought it was a really good way of putting it, actually, that, uh, you know, we are uh, where we were with the US uh, 100 years ago. And that's not to limit uh, our involvement to one or two or a few priority countries. Uh, you have to be there, yes, because the opportunity, we believe, is only going to grow, is only going to expand. But you must have an eye, absolutely, on where the next opportunity is, is going to be. That Be that Eastern Europe, where, you, where of course, again, uh, our biggest markets uh, exist in, in, in Europe. Uh, or is that even further, further afield? Where is the next uh, boom going to be, the next industry, the next, uh, uh, the next growth market? Uh, for Scotland, but the, the share of Scottish exports to China has, has increased. The exports themselves uh, have also increased. So if we're not there, uh, we would absolutely be losing out. Scottish companies would be losing out, and I think uh, even in our investment, we'd be losing out on quite a lot of uh, job creation here in, in Scotland. Thank you. Okay, any final questions from colleagues? No? No? Okay, Minister, I think we've exhausted our questions to you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming to the committee and your very straightforward and, and detailed questions. Um, uh, leave us with no more questions for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to suspend the committee for five minutes just for a quick comfort break.
Okay, and welcome back uh, to the European External Relations Committee. We're moving on swiftly to agenda item three, which is the Brussels Bulletin. Again, the Brussels Bulletin has been put together for us by Scotland Europa, and I invite members to give me comments, questions, points. Helen. <laughs> So I'd just like to say um, that it's very pleasing. I mean, I think we had been advised of this earlier, but it's good to see it confirmed in black and white um, that in terms of uh, Commissioner Almunia, on page three of the Brussels Bulletin, in terms of large companies and the key issue of regional aid to large companies, um, which would have had an impact, a very serious impact in Scotland, I'm very pleased to see it's uh, anticipated that it's going to be uh, or uh, that it will be reversed, that particular ban. And I think that that's, you know, a, a small victory for uh, all of us in this parliament who helped to campaign on that issue. And I know that um, the Cabinet Secretary wrote, and I certainly was campaigning, and a variety of other people were on that issue. So we're very pleased and del delighted at that news. So that's good. Clear. Um, it was just an initial question at the, the top of the Brussels. Uh, initial point C. Thank you very much to the clerks. Getting back on the issues that were raised last week, we get very detailed answers to the questions that were asked. And that was very helpful. Um, I thought it was very interesting that the university rankings on page seven has been mentioned in the Brussels Bulletin, particularly in uh, light of the evidence that we just had from the Minister regarding how important education is. And I think that would be quite interesting to look forward, given that, that Scotland does fare very well in, in some of the established university rankings. So that'll be interesting to see how that develops. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, on page uh, six on the Erasmus um, programme, uh, I'm very pleased that it seems to be, um, well, I'm not actually pleased, but I'm interested to note um, there is a re reduction from the initially proposed 17 billion euros, which would have been a 63% increase in the current uh, budget. But uh, you know, I, th I think it's uh, something that we had all been very fearful that there would have been a huge reduction there. So it's, it's very good to see that there's going to be a, a large increase in real terms on that Erasmus programme because I think it's invaluable for helping uh, students, especially in you know all sorts of areas. Uh, technology and science and all the rest of it to be able to move across the EU and uh, I just think you know in terms of the context of the e the UK debate that's going on just now you know we would lose all of this and that would be such a travesty for um, the benefit of the UK that we had been enriched by uh, particularly science graduates being able to come and work in the UK and be able to benefit um, all of us. So uh, I'm really pleased to read that news there. Yeah, I think on, on the, the backdrop of that, we uh, note at the, the free movement of workers section, which is on page seven as well, which suggests that the, the Commission has proposed legal measures in the form of a directive. Um, now, that, that would be interesting to find out where the UK would, would sit on that one, to be honest, because um, the, the trend is in a different direction to where Europe's going and where the Commission's going. Um, and I think if there is a directive and that needs to be transposed, um, how that process would take place, um, given some of the challenges we've already had with transposition. Yeah. Jimmy. Um, just on the CAP Recovery Fund, on page five, uh, 230 million of the, what's, which has been clawed back from people who haven't um, uh, obviously complied with cross-compliance comp rules. Does that money go back into the EU pot for agriculture? Or, or what, what happens to it? Good question. I think we'll get some clarification for you on, on that one. I mean, I think the, the process of say here what happens. Yeah, to the process of uh, using the Brussels bulletin now is um, there is ways that we can get some feedback, and I think on a technical or procedural clarification, um, maybe a short briefing from Spice, a more detailed policy update, um, or requests for information from the Scottish government. Um, a request for their evidence even, either in written or oral form from whoever we think would be appropriate. Um, uh, I think that if we get that, those 
process is set up properly, then we can get clear answers to some of these questions. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And that's one for Norton. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, Willie, and then Rod. Thanks, Convener. Uh, it was just to refer us back to a previous discussion on the MAF uh, budget arrangements, and I, I see there there was potentially an agreement to be reached a few days ago. Do you, do you recall, members, that one of the potential victims or casualties in the agreement was the, in, the investment in broadband infrastructure? I think that budget was due to take an 80 per cent uh, hit. I, I just wonder if we can find out, Convener, if, if that is in fact the case. and how we might want to kind of raise that as a concern at the committee. I'm sure other members well, within the European really Union would be would be concerned at such a huge drop in provision for broadband infrastructure I investment in Europe. Mm -hmm. I think it was an 80 odd I, something. I would too. It was up, upwards of 80 yeah. <laughs> I, I would also ask, you know, what the effects would be on, 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 on Scotland and, and the, the you know, prescribed... Well, yeah. there's, there's a lot of money due to be rolled out into broadband. Well, considering convener, my understanding from one of our previous um, bulletins was that there's 28 billion across the whole of the EU for broadband, and considering that the UK government only um, made 375 million is the figure that comes to mind available in the UK. I think it was pathetic anyway, uh, that amount of money coming into the UK as a member state. Um, and I really feel that we always hear all these stories, particularly, sorry, <laughs> Jamie, but I mean, they're always going on about, you know, the money that we put into Europe. Why don't they work harder at getting the money that we're entitled to get back into the UK for things like broadband and make sure that our slice of the cake is so much bigger than that? It's just farcical, you know, the, the way that they're behaving down south. Sorry, had my rant. Certainly we've got the EU minister here on the 27th of June, so maybe again that's maybe questions di directly uh, for, for him. And hopefully I know that he watches the committee every time it's on. Um, maybe he's already now been tipped off about some of the questions we're going to ask him. <laughs> Rod. Okay, I just wanted to comment rather than question, just the section on free movement of workers. I was quite interested in the proposed directive uh, requiring member states to create... Um, Kind of points of national contact points provide information and assistance in regard to uh, migrant workers working in the countries. It, given the backdrop and the kind of uh, of uh, kind of free reign, as it were, to Romanians and Bulgarians from the first of January, I thought it was quite an interesting kind of movement. Um, obviously, it's still a proposed directive, but uh, just I was just interested. Because yeah. I think from. Scotland's economic and uh, you know demographic needs. We have different needs from other parts of the UK, so um, that directive might be vitally important for our industry and our education sector, um, and maybe not so vitally important maybe for other parts of the UK. So. It seems to be a step in the right direction. If uh, both employers and migrant workers could kind of have a port of call, could they understand their kind of responsibilities? Um, and the current climate of kind of uh, anti-migrant workers, it's anything that will help to chip away at that was to, to be welcomed. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? No. Are we agreed to send the Brussels Bulletin to the relevant committees? Sorry, yeah, Pels. The official record was about 28 billion euros. Yeah, OK. Not pounds. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> Clarified, yet? <yeah. laughs> OK. Um, we agree to send the Brussels Bulletin to the relevant committees for their Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. And I think we are now moving on to agenda item four, which we agreed to take in private. So I thank all of our public for coming along today.